All right, thanks for joining everyone. We're here for a live build with Alana from the Public Lab Kits team of a camera mount for a balloon mapping um, kit. So um, before we jump into that live build um, and hand it over to Alana, we could do some introductions. Um, Alana, do you wanna kick us off and then we can popcorn around? Sure. So hi guys, my name is Alana Moore. Um, I saw some of y'all in the earlier research area review event. Um, I am calling in from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I grew up down the bayou in a town called Homa, which is why I started doing aerial mapping and more community science. And I'll popcorn to Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Sage. I'm a fellow um, with Public Lab. Currently, I'm doing uh, community organizing and air monitoring near a landfill in Los Angeles County. Um, I want to refresh my skills today with balloon mapping because it's been a while, especially in the pandemic. So I'm excited today. And I will popcorn to Banu. If we have. Okay. Oh. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, I'm audible. I'm audible. We can hear you, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've been following Public Lab's work for a while. Uh, uh, and then I I discovered there's this chat today, so I thought I'll bump, bump in. So I run a, a small local community center here where we teach people on, on programming, hardware, 3D printing, you know, that sort of stuff. And when I started to uh, research on what are the, uh, you know, initiatives like this exist, then I realized Public Lab has been at it for a decade or more. So it's great, good to discover you folks and uh, hope to engage more. Thanks. Why wow, so glad that you found us and could join. Um, sounds thanks. awesome what you're doing, love to hear more later. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, and my name is Jeanette and I'm uh, the research coordinator at Public Lab and I'm I've never done any balloon mapping or any form of aerial photography before. So I'm just excited to learn how to do it and, and um, get myself a kit so I can do it around here. Oh, and I'm calling in from uh, Bellingham, Washington in the Pacific Northwest of the US. All right, Alana, uh, you can take it away. Great, thank you so much, Jeanette. And thanks all y'all for being here. Let me start sharing my screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta update my preferences. Oh no. Okay, I blew it and I have to jump out because I just got a new computer yesterday and I didn't update the permissions. I'm so sorry. Okay. Give me two seconds. <laughs> no problem. I'll just pause the recording and then we can just chat. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. No worries. All right. Let me Computer. let me quit this and come right back. Okay. Well, cool. sorry about that, you guys. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Let me present. Okay, so today we will be building a DIY camera mount for balloon mapping using the public lab kits, uh, larger balloon mapping kit. The same rig that we're building can be attached to any sort of aerial mapping device, including our mini mapping kit or a uh, kite build, but this is the most typical one for balloons. So we're gonna go over the history of the balloon mapping kit how to actually build the DIY camera mount, the next steps once you have built this tool. And then at the end, you guys get a discount code for the balloon mapping kits, which are now back in the store. We had removed them from the store during the pandemic in large part because um, helium was on short supply. It was, I mean, as y'all know, in the kind of like ration state we were in that 
Most uh, medical supplies were diverted towards dealing with the pandemic and healthcare, and helium is one of those things. So one of our metrics for a kit is that it's affordable, and for the year or so that we were on lockdown, helium was not really affordable to be mapping, which is why we removed it from the store. But now things are starting to clear up, and so we are able to source the things we need at reasonable prices once again. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Alana. I am the KITS program manager at Public Lab. Uh, I was raised, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, in this town, Homa, Louisiana, which is very far south. It's almost on the water. And it is a town predominantly run by oil and gas industry. Most folks who have jobs there are working in the industry. Um, I've worked with Public Lab on and off for about six years in many different roles. I came through as a community member at first with just an interest in mapping and aerial studies, um, became a research fellow. I've attended multiple barn raisings, which are our in-person events and meetups, and now I'm a staff member. In addition to my work with Public Lab, I'm a drone pilot and a mapping nerd and a PhD student studying these sort of things, uh, public participation in science. And this picture of me was taken when I was working for the Park Service in Page, Arizona. Uh, Y'all may or may not know that uh, it's illegal to fly drones in the United States National Parks and protected areas. However, you can fly balloons. So whenever I came to them with this idea, they were blown away. There's so many aerial needs they had that they had never found a way of addressing. And with a $100 kit, we're able to meet those needs. Whenever I was doing this work, we were... Um, monitoring archaeological sites along the Colorado River, and we're using the aerial data collected by balloons to measure subsidence and where it was subsiding and where they would need to, you know, have more protections for these sites. So one of the reasons I think that the balloon mapping kit is so impressive is it was the kind of linchpin that spurned all of what Public Lab has turned into now 10 years later. Um, the organization was founded in 2010 in response to the BP oil spill. There were a lot of community members that uh, we noticed would come to, to meetings and say things like, how, how are you saying that the, the oil spill is not that bad and the water is safe and the fish are safe to eat? Whenever our local bayous, you could scoop up oil and gas and just like crude very easily. So this was something that was noticed by community members but didn't really match and correlate with what was being reported in the news, which is how the idea of doing DIY aerial mapping came to be. And so the balloon mapping kit was used to take aerial photos of the oil slick and then measure basically what was visible from the air. And then using metrics, you can determine how thick or thin it is and create estimates and approximate uh, samples of how much oil was actually being leaked. So these numbers were compared to official reports that were submitted by BP and by the Coast Guard. And it was a really pivotal moment, I think, in this kind of mental shift of community members being data points and then turning to data producers. Uh, this is a quote from Shannon Dosmegan and Jeffrey Warren, who are two of the founders of Public Lab. They have been really pivotal in developing these kits and the ethos behind our organization. So as I mentioned here, that uh, the balloon mapping kit is a cheap participatory and hacker kind of tool where we are producing eligible, uh, excuse me, excellent le legible and independently produced data. So while the build that we're gonna do today uses just, you know, household materials, there are other, you know, different ways that you could, you, you could recreate this process for a much more expensive, but, this means you can build a full-on camera aerial mapping rig for $100 to $200. This is an example of one of the original maps we made. This was printed into a community science form as a poster. It is an aerial map of Wilkinson Bay, which is in Louisiana, and this was collected using a balloon mapping. So this is a 10-year-old 11 or so year old map now. And for example, what we do now is we have a service called Map Knitter, which will take your aerial photos and stitch them into one composite image 
which is then overlaid onto Google Maps imagery. And so it creates an interactive map that you can share with other folks online. Here's an example of a Bayou Bienvenue restoration and the folks in the boat flying the, uh, flying the balloon. Okay, so now on to how to build it. I'm gonna do a quick run through of the steps and then actually switch my cameras and show you guys how it's done. Um, for reference, here are where I'm getting this information from. I will post these links in the chat later, but basically these are just to give you a reference of where to find this information to recreate it yourself. So we have a wiki just for building the, the camera rig I'm gonna show you guys today. We have another wiki about balloon mapping that has a lot of other activities and questions and tangential things to kind of help develop your project, as well as our collection of guides, which has both of these information, both of these instructions translated into multiple different languages in case you want to share more widely with your own networks. This is a basic overview of the camera rig. This is a much more intricate version of it. Um, for example, this is the one that I use with the park service that is literally just string that I taped to the camera. So I was not in a position where I really needed it to be exceptionally stable. I was kind of doing a more proof of concept situation with that project, but the rubber bands and the full on setup creates a lot more stability and a lot more protection for your camera while it is, you know, out in the air. The main components of the camera mount are the plastic bottle, which shields the camera from the elements while you're flying. Uh, the PET material, which is the translucent soda bottles, juice bottles, things like that. Not necessarily a gallon jug or like a milk jug that is kind of like dusty to the feel as well as not completely translucent. It needs to be clear like this in order for it to have the proper strength. The other types of um, like the, the gallon jugs are the kinds that will frequently, uh, you know, erode away if they are exposed to the elephants, the elements too much. Whereas these are more or less not even able to break. They're very durable. Um, so yeah, to know it's a PET bottle, it's always transparent and it's marked number one on recycling, the little recycling logo. Um, next is the plastic stabilizing strips or the fins. The fins are these two parts that extend from the main bottle. And so the purpose of this is to stabilize it in the wind, because if you have this hanging up from your balloon, you know, it'll just spin around constantly and this will keep it level. So as your balloon is moving, the camera is staying level. And then the rubber bands absorb the shock and they function as a makeshift gimbal in order to stabilize your camera. So if you're rocking and rolling up there, it will still keep it in place and it'll end up at about a level height. So you're not gonna have much variation in your photos. All right, so into the actual build. I'm just, like I said, gonna run through the steps real quick and then actually do the build. So first you locate your materials, you need a plastic bottle, some string, about six rubber bands and scissors that will be able to cut through the plastic. Um, the choice of bottle is based on what camera you're choosing to send up into the air. We do have a thorough breakdown on common brands of bottles and which ones are the best fit for different types of cameras. Some people do this with uh, larger, larger cameras. Some people do this with cell phones. Some people do this with Raspberry Pis. There's a lot of different variation and in size as well as shape and some some work better than others so once you locate your materials the next step is to cut your bottle in half so this is showing i say half it's not quite half if we're using a two liter bottle i would say it's more so thirds you're going to have the top part is where the camera will actually rest the reason you use the top is because everything is going to come out of the mouth of the bottle and so that gives it kind of like a central gravity point to then stabilize. Uh, the second half of, if I'm saying two thirds, the first third is where the camera is. The second third is what you will use to create the weather strips, the fins. And then the bottom half is typically just waste. 
So once you cut the bottle in half, you make the stabilizers from the two sep uh, second sections, as I mentioned, and you straighten them into as, as straight as they can, typically just uh, folding them and twirling them in the opposite direction of how they were na would naturally bend. Uh, here's an example of me cutting this bottle and then the two, if you look in the photo on the right, the two weather strips on the bottom. You don't necessarily need to, but I typically try to cut two just in case anything happens with the first one. I'll do them about an inch thick, but I'll do one an inch, maybe the second one an inch or two, some sort of variation just to make sure you can, you know, have options as you're building it and make, testing it out. The final step is the most difficult, which is building a harness. So you use rubber bands and strings in order to suspend the camera within the bottle. Um, on the left is a photo of the build more or less complete. And on the right, I just zoomed in on the knot that you tie. I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure of the name of the knot because I wasn't a very good Girl Scout, but it's a very simple knot that in these latex free rubber bands that we use, it is almost un unknottable. Oop, okay, let me now switch my screen to actually show you guys how to build. Okay, here we go. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Great, great, great. Okay. So as I mentioned, here is the camera build that I have made already. I'm just going to disassemble you completely. You off to the side. So as you can see, the main trick is you have, where'd my little rubber bands go? Oh, well, I'll make some more. So there are two doubled rubber bands that are here on the front of the camera and then a bridge between them. This is basically the main structure you need to create. And then from there, everything extends on to either stabilize the camera or to attach to the balloon. So right now this is missing a secondary loop, which would actually attach to the balloon. At the moment, we only have the one loop that connects it to the, to the rig itself. So let me take you apart. All right. So the first step is you get two rubber bands that will be the ones that actually go around the camera. Let me get a blue one too, just to have some color differentiation between them. All right. So your first step is you double up one balloon or one, excuse me, one rubber band. And you tie the first of what will be the bridge to this. The knot you use is you just loop it through, loop this small end around and pull it taut. Like so. So this orange is what will actually be going around the camera. The blue rubber band is what will be the bridge. So you do this twice in order to make sort of like a handcuff shape with your rubber bands. Get another double knot. You loop it in like, like so. And tie this into a knot. Knots are definitely tough, especially with latex, especially with these silly acrylic nails I got on. <laughs> All right. So here is the first step of what will be your, this is the first step of what will be your camera mount. Each of these pieces will go on either side of the camera. And this is an old Polaroid camera that I'm using primarily because it can be lost and I will not really be out of much money or, you know, resource. So depending on your camera, for example, this one has an extendable lens. Oh no. So 
So if you have one that has a lens that actually does extend, my batteries are not working, but that is something to take into consideration when you are doing this build that your rubber band will not actually impact the way that the lens opens. This Polaroid, as I mentioned, doesn't have that feature, does not matter. All right, so the next step, once you've built the base of your camera rig is to build the, the second part that will actually lift up the camera into the mouth of the bottle. This is done in the same way of just tying the same knot around your bridge rubber band, like so. And you want as much as you are able to, to get it in the center of this bridge. Because this is what will actually, as I mentioned, lifts the camera into the rubber band, or excuse me, into the rig. And so you want it to be holding as, as much in the middle so that your camera is flat to the ground. The final step is building the first of two loops. This loop will attach the camera to the bottle in these slit. Ooh, here we go. There are slits on either side of this plastic bottle that were cut. One of these slits will hold the fins, as you see here. It's one strip of plastic, and then about one inch from the bottom, one inch wide. This will hold this. There's an identical slit on the opposite side, which the camera loop will go into. I'll explain that now. This is the loop that will attach to the bottle. What you want to do is create basically two loops. So one will be here attached to the rig with the rubber bands and the other end will be affixed to the plastic bottle. So again, the same way you're tying these basic knots, you're wanting to do this here again as much as possible within the center. Uh, so this you get it centered. You do a loop, you pass the loop through. And then try to get it centered. Great. All right. One thing to note, which has happened to me, a pro tip, is if you have any extra strings, you want to cut them off early on because I've had the camera go up in the air and then one of these little tiny strings ends up in front of my lens and then ruins all of my photographs. So you don't want to have that happen to you. All right, so here are all the pieces we're going to need for this build, which is the two rubber bands that go around the camera, the bridge that actually will lift it up and out of the bottle, is this one and then this loop that will attach to the plastic casing. So this final loop we're going to tie to this piece of string using the same old trusty knot. All right. Now to hook it up to the camera. As I mentioned, the blue is the bridge. These two oranges are the ones that go around your camera itself that have been doubled over. This part's a little tricky because it can be kind of tight and you need to be conscious of the features of your camera that you're going to be needing, such as the capture photo button and the power button. Typically, um, we have different ways of triggering the camera in the air. One of them is using a Canon camera with a, uh, a hacked memory card. The Canon Hackers Development Kit is a software that you can you just put onto your memory card and you can tell your camera to trigger and take a photo every five to 10 minutes. The true DIY way is you set your rubber bands like this and you put a rock underneath it. And so you just have it truly hold the button down from the time it goes into the air until it comes back down. It ends up in some really funny um, process pictures, you know, when you can see 
yourself as the balloon's flying away from you. All right, so you've put these two orange on your camera. Try your best to have your blue bridge one in the back. The back of the camera, I mean, excuse me. All right, getting the second one around here. As I mentioned, this camera is kind of a weird shape, so I'm going to go ahead and put these two pieces of the rubber band on either side of the lens. And as I mentioned, this can be done with so many different types of cameras, so many different shapes and sizes. A lot of the uh, more nuanced aspects are kind of variable of figuring out how to get it the most level. As you can see, this is kind of tilted. So I'm just gonna keep playing with these rubber bands and trying to straighten them out on the body of the camera as well as in this lift aspect on this blue rubber band just to make sure that I've got things as straight as they can possibly be. And that whenever I hold the camera up as a test, that it looks about level, which is hard to see with this overhead webcam, but we're doing pretty okay right now. So here's what it looks like from the top of the camera. Oops. Got the two oranges here this blue one and then this this orange here that I'm holding is what will actually lift the camera out of the bottle. So moving on to that point. You take the loop and you feed this through the mouth. Lift it up. Again, this is where you're kind of like doing more precision adjustments, making sure that the camera is looks about level whenever you hold it because it's going to end up you know floating about like this and so you want before you even lift off your thing your situation to be as level and functional as possible next once you have it in let me do it again next once you have everything in place and you feel confident with your your measurements you'll take this the string loop the very last end and you will hook it into the one inch slit right here so this is what secures it and make sure that your camera is not going to just fall off or fall off the balloon it basically gives you a second a second connection point so that if something does happen between your rig and your uh balloon that your your camera will stay contained within the rig so if it does fall to the ground it will have some sort of protection of this bottle and it will not just come you know crashing down um y'all can't really see but i made my string a little bit too long in this situation i would go in and tie it just so that the camera is hosted a little bit higher up into the bottle Right now it kind of has a little bit too much give, but that's an easy fix. A lot of doing these kind of DIY builds is, you know, you try it and then you go again and you try it again. The one extra additional part of this is that there should be a place to connect this rig to your balloon mapping kit. You could reuse the same string here, but it's safer to have a secondary loop. So there's one connecting it to the, the rig and there's a secondary one connecting it to your balloon. It's not necessary, but it does make things a little bit easier. And then the last step is attaching the fins. So as you can see, we have the string hooked on this. There should be an identical slit on the opposite side of the bottle. And what you do is you take your one strip of plastic here that I have folded and gotten as straight as possible, and you slide it into this. creating the fin of your bottle. At this point, you would attach it in, any, in whatever way you see fit. You can crimp the plastic, you can melt the plastic, you could just tape this part, which I think I'm gonna do. 
for ease and accessibility. This is just taping the one fin, the one strip of plastic to the bottle itself. These fins are not necessarily essential. Your rig will still function in the same way and it'll still protect your camera without this. However, this in my experience has been really remarkable in preventing twisting and turning from occurring while you are flying. And then that is it. So here is the top view. Here is a side view. Let's see the fins back here. They have been taped with masking blue tape. Um, here's a view from the bottom. So this is what this is what is actually like facing the ground. See, I have trouble here with it covering my lens. Yes, this is how you whenever your balloon is flying above you, this is what you will see. And that's it. So back to screen sharing. To do. Whoops. Here we go. So once you have built your rig, what is next? This is a photo from a barn raising about two years ago, I believe, in Galveston. Um, I was droning, so I took this picture of the above balloon. But yeah, it was a really incredible experience to get to do this and have so many folks there get to see the start to finish process of collecting the data and then actually, you know, doing the processing in the field. Our map knitter software is available for free and very functional and you're able to create maps in no time at all. So once you have your balloon mapping kit ready to launch, you can organize a mapping meet meetup. So you gather a group of folks who have a shared concern, either um, you know a space-based concern or maybe an industry-based concern. And then you discuss the group's needs for aerial data and your dissemination plans. So what do you need imagery of? What are you planning on doing with it? How do you want to process it? And how do you want to present it? Next is planning your flight. This, this can get a little, I don't want to say tricky, but it's basically like the more that you do it, the better you understand how to do the data collection process. The way that MapKnitter works and the way that these um, satellite imagery companies work is they create overlapping images and then stitch them together. So if there's a specific area of interest, you need to have more photos of that to then have more detail. So it's not the MapNet or software interpolates where there is no data. So it's best to have, you know, excessive coverage in spaces that you're trying to do more, more detailed research upon. So decide where you want to map, where you'll launch the balloon and how you want to run transects. Um, do you want to go north to south? Is the situation, are there obstacles in your way? Do you need to do this in a walking sense or do you have to be doing it by boat? Um, also, who is going to be the spotter and who's going to fly the balloon? While balloon mapping is useful in the sense that it can be done on a solo basis, there are a lot of things that could get in the way. There are birds that could attack you. There's truly an endless list of things that could cause difficulties. So it's always recommended to have at least two people in the field. So you can have someone who's physically man handling the balloon and then a second person is able to keep an eye on it as well as look for obstacles. Uh, once you've collected data, you can upload your photos to MapKnitter, which will stitch those photos into one image that can be downloaded and incorporated into GIS or other mapping softwares and then publish your work at Public Lab because we have a extensive set of activities and other other things that people can reference to kind of help guide in designing your own mapping projects. We have tons of people in 10 years of work that have been doing really interesting uh, different processes with the same tool. Like I mentioned, I was doing the archeological modeling uh, before the call started. Sarah and I were talking about like doing volumetric measurements. Basically this data is extremely versatile and 
the quality is dependent upon mostly your camera and your distance from the earth so you're able to really adjust and you know scale this this tool to meet your needs both in terms of like area coverage as well as legal limitations like i mentioned not being able to fly drones in the park service this balloon provided a cool alternative so yeah it's a really really versatile and useful tool as well as being extremely affordable on that note um so yeah we brought the kits back they are for the larger mapping kit it's a hundred dollars for the mini mapping kit which you get three mylar balloons is fifty dollars and so yes in using this code zoom out all caps you can get 20 percent off of all of our mapping kits in the store it only applies to mapping kits so that means the chloroplane balloon replacements the large uh 170 centimeter map kit which is our our regular size one and then the mini mapping kits where you get the three mylar balloons and that's all I've got for you guys. So if anyone has any questions and wants to reach out to me personally or directly, my email is Alana at Public Lab, and I'm happy to answer any questions you'll have. Um, I had to go uh, check my dogs for a second, and I, I just, I don't know if I missed the map knitter portion of it. I didn't go too deep into map knitter because I don't have the most experience with it personally. Where I'm stalled a little bit. Uh huh. Yeah, map knitter is something that I have used for because again, I'm coming from this doing drone work as like that. That has been my source of big income basically for the past like couple of years. Like I. I do my own thing that I care about for my nine to fives, but I can make $5,000 on one job doing drone stuff. So I'm saying this to say I already have the software that does the more heavy duty processing and the like higher resolution photos. But yeah, MapNitter is really good for quick and on the fly processing to make sure I use MapNitter personally to make sure that I've collected all the sites that I need. So if I am doing a balloon balloon mapping, and you know there's something kind of on the edge that is not necessarily like whenever i was doing this in arizona we had a lot of water features that we couldn't cross and so we were just hoping that the wind would be going in the right direction to kind of push that balloon far enough over the water that we could capture what we needed in those situations i would upload my photos to map knitter make sure that all the areas i got were covered i had the cool ground truth check of using the satellite imagery but yeah, I am not as experienced with map knitter myself. And so I don't, I don't speak on it because of that reason. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that I am hoping to start using more in doing more like education stuff and like working with kids because yeah, the software that I use is extremely expensive. It is prohibitive for most folks that are not actively doing this work, you know? But there are, I don't know, there are ways of getting access to that software too. Like I mentioned, free trials and things like that are a godsend. Sarah, what's the part that you're getting stuck on? Um, is it with MapNator or is it um, something upstream of that? Well, I tried it a couple of years ago. So I haven't flown a balloon since then. And, um, We've had a little bit of issues, like sometimes, um, you know, I use an old iPhone, you know, I have my old rigging kit here. And um, sometimes like one time we had the camera, somebody accidentally touched it. So we did a flight and it was just recording the sky. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> so I've had a lot of little issues like that. Um, I think that when you make a mistake, it's really good because you get to learn from it. So that doesn't really bog me down too much. Um, but the map knitter software, I'm sure it's been updated. And um, maybe that's a Jeff Warren question more so or a Liz question. I know we did update it very recently, but we didn't do a big rollout on it. So I think it might still be in a beta form in its new form. Yeah, I had an experience, the shareable maps, 
as we have now where it will do the full overlay and give you an embeddable link. That was something I noticed was new and I think is very useful. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other question I, now that I have you is, uh, what are expiration dates for rubber bands and the balloons themselves? Uh, the balloons, I believe we have like a rule of thumb to that they can be used and inflated, deflated five times. Okay. But I've used them for more than that and I've had them for much longer. Do yeah, I, I think I've exceeded that limit, but that combined with the fact that they're old and you don't want to risk like something dropping and right. yeah. Um, right. And then my other question is the the nylon rope is there an expiration for this or do do when if it yellows do we need to replace it or um i'm not quite sure i don't believe so the folks that we get these from shanty kites they build them as if they are oh usable forever oh okay well that's that was the other question i had and then in the past, when balloon mapping was done, you know, I'm talking six years ago or so with Public Lab, it, I think there was like, a, there wasn't a specification that it needed to be PET, like you get an old milk jug or something. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying it's preferable to do the PET, like a juice, like a large juice bottle instead. Yeah, the PET is preferable for its durability, mostly. Right. That um, if this bad boy, and I mean, it's it's an interesting kind of inverse relationship because usually we're like, no, PET, no plastic. But because right, right. it does never break <laughs> down, this your rig could sit out in the rain for a week and it would still be as sturdy as it was the day you set it out there kind of thing. Okay. Versus right. the milk jugs and all of those are easier to degrade. And so if you are... I mean, who's flying a five foot balloon in a rainstorm besides like some Jefferson kind of thing or no, that's Ben what? Franklin. That's <laughs> Ben Franklin. <laughs> I got him confused. But yeah, who's doing that? But if you were, it would be able to withstand that much better. Okay. And then um, I, I mean, using an iPhone, an old iPhone is just as acceptable, right? Totally. I think better personally, because you're able to focus that better as uh -huh. well as it has usually more storage, uh -huh. you know, and they, there are means of programming the camera that way that is not using, uh, you know, hacker methods. Right. Like, I've had, and, and they're lighter too, also. Oh than, yeah. Lighter. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Yeah. I've taken like a, you know, an expensive Canon up before, which is not mm -mm. the smartest thing to do. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, so my other question is how many times have you lost a rig? I have not. Thank God. Truly. Really? Thank God. I've been terrified of, I, I am a bad person for flying drones and doing this stuff because I'm extremely anxious and like worst case scenario minded. So I am permanently like today is going to be the day that I'm going to lose the whole thing. The balloon's going to blow up, whatever it is. And I haven't, but I also, for that reason, double, triple tie every single knot, as well as like duct tape it. Like I mentioned, okay. this, this one that I had that was just string, you know, mm -hmm. this was the base, but I did this so many times over and just have so many, so much tape on this, so many knots, so many secondary strings that I was using for this. But yeah, part of this was also the weight being an issue. And so whenever I would have the bands on it, I couldn't get it to get perfectly level. And I just needed this like, just the string and just the tape. Oh, I see. And it's different. It's different for all cameras, different for all setups, and also for like comfort levels. So, yeah. your method of not losing a rig is just basically to double tie, double check. Do you ever double use double rubber bands to in case there's a failure? I get to tape more if it comes to that. Like if it comes to the point that I am nervous, because you mentioned the longevity of the rubber bands as well. We use the non-latex version because they do have, studies say, I guess, more durability. But yeah, whenever it gets to the point that I'm even iffy on any kind of weakness, I'll just tape it down. Okay. And then as far as, uh, I'm not a math person. So one of the other things that confuses me or 
it's like an emotional barrier is, am I going to be able to fly this high enough to get the angle correctly? Do you perform any kind of calculation, a quick one to see how far you need to be able to look uh, into a distance? So um, what do you say, what do you say into a distance? What do you mean? Okay, so I I'm talking about like a, calculating what the view will be from the rig like, like the resolution or no, I, i'm talking about the angle gotcha. like what what is the highest and lowest that i need to fly the balloon in order to get the full picture or at least be able to sometimes we've taken them in their shallow views mm -hmm. and um I don't know, maybe it's like when you you have the balloon in the air and you start to see it disappear into the atmosphere, you're kind of like, well, where is it? Is this working kind of a thing? Is it high enough? So my, my question is, is it worthwhile to mark the tape, the, meaning the, the spool that you have mm -hmm. to know how far, or am I, am I being too detailed about this? So you just go out and eyeball it. Uh, I don't think you're being too detailed. It is more just kind of like understanding your own needs and what you are trying to accomplish with it. So uh -huh. I have a spreadsheet that can, you can enter the height as well as the megapixels of your camera and get an understanding of what the, what area you would be covering at that point, as well as what the res resolution of your photos would be. Because, That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, I have that. And I had that it, it is from a drone thing, but you can use it the same way. All you would do is severely downsample your megapixels from, you know, 12 to two, if you're using an old camera like this. Um, so that's, that's a tip. The rule, the reels that we sell are a thousand feet. Yeah. So I have not marked them because I haven't found or just like conceptualized a way to really do that unless I was to just spool out, you know, like, Five and then feet measure it with a hundred foot tape. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I haven't thought of any way of doing that, but whenever I was, whenever I was doing this work in Arizona, especially, I was kind of worried about that because we were near the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of like rescue situations. Basically, I didn't want. When I worked in the park service, we sunk a boat, and so I was terrified that something was going to happen. I was literally like a helicopter is going to be coming by today and they're going to see this balloon. They're either going to pop it. They're going to like call in some, you know, emergency something. I'm always worried about that. Yeah. And I, I, I've looked at the FCC guidelines for my County and, you know, it, it always bothers me that maybe that will happen. <laughs> you know, somebody will be really upset. Yeah. So it didn't happen, but for that reason, I was, adamant whenever I went and did this with a thousand foot reel that I didn't want it to go farther out than halfway. And again, that was just eyeballing it, but I was like, I assume I am at about 500 feet. And um, there are different ways to kind of like guesstimate it. There are folks that will build these rigs and attach a, a GPS to it. Scott Eustace, who works here yeah. down in Louisiana, he does that a lot. And that, as you mentioned, like zippering those two data sets, he can then get the GPS coordinates and match it with a timestamp to the EXIF data in the photos and then create it where your photos actually have geolocation that like is not accurate, accurate, but good enough to know if you're at 500 feet or a thousand feet kind of thing. So it, what it's doing with that GPS data logger is, is adding a value for the altitude then? correct it's not adding a value directly you have to go and do post-processing to well that's what i meant together. like to your yes. data set yes but so you but, tell it to log a new location every 10 seconds or something and then that will do that every 10 seconds and then i wish i could remember the name of the software scott knows it and can tell me but there's a software where you upload the two data sets the gps points with timestamps yeah your photos with timestamps and that's where it does the merging for you together. So why is is why is the iPhone at EXIF data not sufficient? Oh, for that's that? sufficient. That's, that's So fine. if you use an iPhone that 
that would be included in all of that data. Yep, completely. Okay. Yeah, that is kind of like the trick means of doing it is that you would already have that data programmed completely. You get the whole geolocation. It's just, I think that we're all still using like old Canon cameras that we've been using forever kind of thing. And and the, I, I can't remember. I don't think the EXIF data includes altitude, does it? Um, I don't know, but maybe actually. Let me open Photoshop and see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it is a possibility if it does have an X and a Y that could also have a Z. Right. But I am not a hundred percent sure on that. I hadn't thought of using an iPhone. Also, it's like, I'm realizing now in the five years since I have been doing this, how much things have changed, how much more accessible these things are, you know, that like, I do have a spare iPhone that I don't use that I could just go and throw up into the air, you know, and it wouldn't be like a loss to me. But also right. in the same sense, I went to Costco yesterday and they sell drones for $500 now, which yeah, they're not, they're not as expensive as they used to be. Right. It used to be. And I remember whenever I was first joining public lab, they were like, no drones, you know, like they were, they were not as in favor of it, mostly because of the accessibility aspect, because right. Yeah, like if, if it's $3,000, they don't necessarily want to advocate for that as a community science technique. But now that drones are becoming more less expensive, that argument is not as strong. Although there is a now much stronger case for the fact that this bypasses a lot of the FCC bans, that this is a safer means of collecting data and right. people in other places that drones are not. Right, because drones are, that's that's why we are wanting to get more data through balloon mapping because it's classified as a toy. And if we fly it under a certain altitude, then we're fine, yeah. according to privacy laws and whatnot. I'm looking at the EXIF data here on the iPhone. I have um I have a DJI Mavic and that one includes the altitude in it, but I'm curious how it does it. I haven't like reverse engineered to understand that. But I know that definitely they have solved some sort of way to, I mean, like you're saying, I'm sure there are cameras that specifically do this, you know? I keep picking, I you know, before I post things to public lab, I, cause I'm getting photos. I, I clear that data through Photoshop. So mm -hmm. I, I'm actually picking up things that I've already cleared. So hold on, let me check. That's funny. <laughs> uh, okay, here we are. Okay, well, I don't think, I think that I'll just continue using, I'll just use an old iPhone and grab the data that way yeah the I, geospatial information that way yeah i think that's a really brilliant means of doing it um are you doing any vegetation monitoring no, no we are only concerned with um we have a regulatory gap where we live where nobody's monitoring the ambient air and it's been like a I've been involved in this for almost 10 years <laughs> trying to get air monitoring. So the, we're just trying to gather as much information for advocacy. That's been our method, essentially, to try to get regulatory agencies to listen to us. And um, maybe that also helps other communities that are going through the same thing that we are. Yeah. Would yes. infrared imaging have I do any have, I do have, that was, thank you for mentioning that because um, one of the things, you know, I have a FLIR camera that I use and one of the things I wanted to do, it has to be attached to an iPhone. It's one of these, uh, you know, one of those small mm -hmm. ones that mm -hmm. you put into the, your iPhone and then it, it uses an app. So I'm wondering if I could just, 
use that and risk it and see if there is any type of, but how far will that be picking up atmospheric? Um, will the atmosphere interfere with anything that would be local to something that was happening on land? If I flew a balloon with an, with an IR camera. I think it depends on how high you're flying, but I can't envision there'd be that much distortion from really? just a thousand feet. I, I might be so wrong on this and don't. One of the issues we're trying to figure answer. out is how many underground fires are going on there. <laughs> Cause we, that's a normal thing that happens. Like wow. it's expected with the large landfill. And I think, I think if you were to do that, project it would be cool to have your FLIR camera next to like our infogram pie kind of thing I have one and here you, yeah you would then have two different you'd have the heat data as well as the infrared data and you can kind of verify if one of them is super wonky that maybe that one's distorted you know or if they both line up and you have two two that you can corroborate so I in that case the rig would look like I would have two iPhones, throwaway iPhones. That one, one, I think one throwaway iPhone, one hundred twenty dollar Pi camera, and I'm just envisioning if you linked them together and then had like if we went with a milk jug, a wider jug, you know, and you just had the two of them next to each other. The iPhone. Right. Does the iPhone take regular photos while the thermal is taking photos, or no? No. Okay. So what happens is that, um, oh, I should, I need to find it somewhere. I think it's inside my house, but, um, I think, I know, I know what you're talking about though. I have a friend. It's like, it's like a little tiny camera and, um, it can take video while it's in operation also, but you can also set it, you know, we could do that same shutter figure out a shutter hack release but mm -hmm. it does take uh video accurately and that's better than nothing yeah that's cool yeah i was thinking if you could have again this just adding on to it but if you had all three a like natural color a thermal and an infrared there's truly like an endless amount of processing and data you know Insights really? that I could show you. Yeah, there's a lot that that could be that could be done with that in order to kind of like suss out whatever features you're trying to find. And to like you're saying, verify if there is any distortion. Right. So uh, let me see if I have that infogram thing here. You're talking about this one here, right? That is the filter for it. The camera itself looks like this, but with the red filter on it. Oh, okay. Well, I that's good to know. And then um, has anyone ever flown a spectrometer up on the balloon mapping, mapping either? Has that no, been no. a... Not that I know of, I feel most of like the spectral work that's been done with this was with these infrared infogram cameras. Yeah. Cause the, the camera itself has the IR channel switched, the red channel switch for an, an uh, infrared camera channel, excuse me, and then has the red filter on top. So what it's doing is it's actually measuring the infrared reflectance. So the spectral nature would be through this with, um, with that information the infrared reflectance, that's what I was asking about vegetation. You can tell if your plants are healthy or not. Healthy plants give off more infrared, whereas plants that are dying give off less. So you can use that to see other things that are emitting in the infrared range of the spectrum, but I don't think that people are doing much with spectrometry up there. Because a lot right, of that is- There'd be a lot of distortion with that, I think. Yeah, and you would never know specifically what reflectance it is Mm -hmm. Marking is it the ground? Is it like a sunbeam it caught? You know, like right. what what is the specific thing? That's why having the camera that takes the spectral photo is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, these guys, these infogram pies, if you get a battery with it, they can stream your video. Also, 
So that is wow. useful in the sense of, I don't know, to a thousand feet, I've never done it, but you could be streaming your balloon from the air. Right. And then that, in that case, if it gets lost, then at, at the very least, your data isn't gone. You don't have to retrieve it from the device. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I don't know if I would trust a secondary, cause it's like, it's like live streaming, you know, like you go to a website and it shows it. So unless you're capturing it, yeah. Unless you're screen recording that, then yeah, but that is true. Yeah. You wouldn't lose your data. You would at least have some sort of a record. Yeah. And then, um, you said earlier that the possibilities of analysis for something like that would be endless. And what are you imagining? So I, I came to doing this sort of stuff from doing more remote sensing work. Like I worked with NASA for a minute, NASA develop that was trying to do, um, is basically teaching young folks how to do remote sensing and how to get the most out of NASA's data. And a lot of the projects that I was working on were trying to develop new indices. So what that means, do you know about like the NDVI, like normalized difference vegetation index? I'm not very familiar. I know what it is, but I don't know about that. So, so basically it is taking a photo and each pixel is assigned a value of one or negative one. Okay. And then one is healthy reflectance, negative one is unhealthy reflectance. Okay. So that's how that's how you calculate in DVI. That's what people are doing to measure their crops health and stuff. Like a uh, practical use of this is you could fly over a field of corn, see where the corn is healthy, where it's not healthy. Instead of putting fertilizer everywhere, you only put it where it's needed. And so you're saving farmers money. That's like one way people will do this sort of thing. But so that processing is done just using either a remote sensing software such as ERDAS Imagine. Now like ArcGIS and QGIS have these capabilities too. But basically you're just doing math on a photo. It's raster math. So okay. you're adding two values together to get a, um, a value that you're determining, you know, the negative one plus one, you could do that similar processing to have different ends and to see, but like I have used it with archaeology to do NDWI, which is normalized difference wetness index. And so with that, we are again using infrared, able to do a different calculation than the NDVI calculation and we're able to determine where soil is more moist or less moist. Oh, that's really clever. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways this can be done. NDVI is the proven one. Like the, this is definitely what works. This is the exact formula you need to do. This is the exact parameters you need to take photos with. So that's why that's the one you always hear about. There are multiple different kind of like still in beta phase indices as well as people constantly trying to figure out more because we have this, this imagery, like we have tons of multispectral imagery from, you know, years and years and years past of satellites flying by. So people are trying to figure out what can we do with this data that exists in new processing methods. And that's something I've been really interested in, but haven't, you know, done enough to really develop one myself or get into the back end of how this is working. I just tell my software what I want it to do for me kind of thing, you know? You're right. And so in terms of infrared imaging, um, you're going to get values for heat. Um, and I mean, what, else, what other things? Because we're not talking about any type of um, biota issue. We're talking about like, uh, we're trying to essentially what we would be doing. Um, so I don't know how familiar you are with the way landfills operate, but they have to, in the state of California, they have to get new permits to uh, use certain parts of their landfill. So it's like part of their con conditional use permit. So they could have a number of open cells at one time and you don't know where they're going to be landfilling, which means if they're landfilling close to a human population or a residential area, 
um, because the landfill is massive. Um, you, we want to try to use that tool, the balloon mapping tool, just visually, just plain color to say, oh, I can see that they're landfilling in this location. And tomorrow, let's not waste our time over here. We'll, we know that they're actively landfilling here and we should be maybe bring out the SO2 monitor and, and stuff like that. So um, I'm just kind of curious to see what other types of tools we could add to the balloon map. And I'm gonna look into those. Yeah, I'm trying to check also what, if there's any precedent for folks measuring, I don't know, any kind of air quality or any sort of like VOC right. possibly with this infrared. Or yeah, can, how, what, what other kinds of complementary data can we, uh, acquire. Yeah, I'm trying to scroll through real quick and see if I can find anything, but every pretty much everything about infrared immediately goes to either heat or vegetation monitoring because those are the two that are right like said, stamped with a science stamp, you know, like this is approved. But I think that there's a lot of potential for other things and that's what makes public lab cool is people being like, this has to work, right? And then just trying stuff out until they figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, it could be, it could be a really awesome way for you to test that though, you know? Like if you have the site and you know what's going on there, or even have an inkling of, you know, like how it's being run, and then you can come through with three different data sets and then actually like piece things together. Yeah. Really yeah. So we haven't, I know we need to get replacement um, balloons. So we haven't, and I don't have time at the moment, but when I do fly, do another flight, I wanna make sure that I'm prepared because I wanna try to gather as much data as I can. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Oh, the last thing I was gonna ask you is you had a really cool image on your um, presentation of the different parts of your rig. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's on um, the public lab site, if I could get that from you, because it was really, really cool. Is it the, the one with the thing already built or each individual piece? Um, the one built. Uh, yeah, that is from Jeanette. I hope you remember. I hope you know this guy's name. Matthew something. He's Lippincott? the one. Who, huh? Lippincott? The one who's oh, done Matt Lippincott. Yeah, I remember And he's him. done most of the balloon mapping stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He was out of Portland, correct? I think. I have met him before in my life, but... He was at the... Yeah, I think I met him at a barn raising. Yeah, I'm sending you person. the... Oops, no, I sent it to Jeanette. Everyone, there you go. That is where that photo came from um and this is all y'all tell me if this is matt lincott his uh public lab name is just matt so uh -huh. he has red hair oh yeah yeah that's matt okay so i, I know who you're talking about now <laughs> yeah so matt is who taught me how to do all of this stuff and who did most of the work on the rigs he uh basically is the one holding all that knowledge and yeah, he created most of the graphics. That... Okay, so that was Matt's. Thank oh, you yeah. so much for this and bookmarking it right now. Of course, you're so welcome. Yeah, this is one thing that I wanted to bring up or in highlight in this in this call is that all this information is here, but it is buried, definitely. And um, while we are trying to, me and Jeanette especially, are trying to dig out all of the, you know, morsels of information that are deep, deep, deep in someone else's wiki kind of thing. This is one that kind of sunk to the bottom. So now we're trying to reorganize the balloon mapping wiki so there is more clear direction and pathways to find the information you need. Okay, and then if I used a milk jug for this, it's, it's essentially like a one-time use, uh, correct? I'd, I wouldn't even say that. I think that it's honestly fine. I don't oh, think okay. that I don't think that it's to the point that it's going to degrade in a day sort of thing. I've previously only used milk jugs or water jugs because they're larger. Yeah, you can fit more equipment in it. Right. 
So I only learned that they were not suggested from reading Matt's info just, you know, today or yesterday. Oh. And yeah, that was news to me, but it doesn't make sense when you think about it. Even like on the ability for me to cut it, you know, I could take a dull scissor and stab it into a milk jug, but this root beer bottle, I literally had to like hack at it to get through. We had to get like kitchen, really good kitchen scissors yeah. or something. Yeah. I was about to whip out an X-Acto knife. I was so just like, why is it so difficult? And I was like, oh, there is a specific reason it is so difficult. This plastic is literally like unpenetrable. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. Yeah, but it's, it's funny because I was like, like I said, like it's usually we shy away from this because it is wasteful and it is, you know, not going to break down. But then in this sense, we're reusing something in a way that it's not going to go to a landfill. It's going to be actually used even if, you know. Yeah, it just it's just like uh, counterintuitive in some way, but then it makes sense when you think about it. Right. Yeah. So my first question was about the, or one of my early questions about the angle. And I think that in the past we haven't flown it high enough. And so it looks like images more from kite mapping. Do you know what I'm talking about? Rather than like, or, or the wind might shift it over. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a, we get a lot of coastal wind and it's gusty. We're in a wind corridor. So those are all the things that we were, I thought that maybe shortening the lead would be a way to control that. So I think what I need to do when I take it out is to just be really careful about the wind direction and speed when I do it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I was, I was a bit confused when you were talking about the angle, because I was wondering if you were meaning it like, I don't no, the camera about. ain't like it's 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 if you get it up high enough, it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Because it's gonna mm -hmm. it's going to get the data, the, the visual data that you need. Yeah. Um so I those are really, really good tips. I'm trying to get you the the resolution calculator. Why does Pat Coyle sound super familiar? I think that's I'm sorry, another I'm long at, time, another long time public. May have been somebody member. in the past, yeah. Who's done a lot to... of mapping as well. Right. So Matt, right. I, I I'm getting back into this from the Matt period. Uh Matt Lippincott's period. Okay. Just wanted to note that we're approaching um the bottom of the hour and are still recording too, so we, 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 which is fine. Well, I'm we, the only one in the room now. I know. <laughs> I have you all to myself. Okay, um, I found the calculator. Should I send it to you in this chat or in Slack? Yes. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> you do you want it here? Or do you want it in Slack? Yeah, you keep it there. I, I'm fine. You just you can just drop it. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. I think I did a pop out this time in the chat. And yeah, Sarah, um, I haven't sent you those balloons yet because I've been swamped on things. But oh, I haven't now... requested the ferals because I've been swamped too. Oh, you're not doing that. I was going to go to the SKC site to get the new ferals for the, we're talking if about you, the bucket kit. If you, if you want them from us, I can get them, but I think it's cheaper and easier for you to just get them straight from them. Do you know what's crazy is I have an order from them from polyethylene tubing that never arrived and I have to track that down. It's Weird. Just, yeah, I have a lot of little loose ends to. So. Okay, here we go. That's your spreadsheet. That and this is through the company that does my drone modeling stuff. So that's okay, where this was what I was looking for because I know yeah. it does make a difference. Yeah. You know, I did a little bit of camera, like I took one of those Coursera things to learn how to take pictures. Yeah, I had to uh, do that whenever I was doing my 3D modeling stuff with the Park Service and they cared so much, like that, that was their priority was like best data, whereas I was right. like best practice. And so we had very different views on how we like handled it. So they made right. all that stuff when I was like, I don't care. This, oh, this care is perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. You need the focal length of the camera, first of all. Yeah, cool. 
Cool, okay, cool. wonderful. Glad to link you together with that. All right, should we should we call it, team? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. That was that was awesome. A lot. I learned so much. <laughs> I'm glad. So glad. Um, I need to work on my live build setup so I have a better camera and more space. Because I was like building it to the side, and I thought I was in view, and I'd look at my computer and be like, "Dang." <laughs> We can see, we can see it pretty well. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna stop recording now, but that, that was super helpful. Thanks, Alana. Of course. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs>